Hello and welcome back to the channel. It's finally here. We're finally looking at episode 13 of Cells at Work. So this is part two of Hemorrhagic Shock. And if you'd have told me at the beginning of this series that I'd be finishing off <laughs> looking at these in the middle of a pandemic, I would have told you you were crazy, but that's the reality where we're at. I really want to get this video out just in time to cover season two next month and Cells at Work Black as well, which I definitely want to cover on the channel. The season finale is actually broken down to two parts. If you can't remember what happened in the last one, then go back and watch the video, but I'll give you a quick recap now. It started out with a bit of a lap of honor, red blood cell going and seeing all the immune cells we've seen throughout the series. We know it's the season finale, so that peacefulness wasn't gonna last long. Red blood cell had a new apprentice that she's showing along the ropes, and she had a very tender moment with white blood cell. Before the major trauma happened that's led to the hemorrhage. In the video, we talked about the four stages of hemorrhagic shock, so I won't be covering that again. And it ended with white blood cell occupying what seemed like an empty blood vessel. We also met a bacteria in that episode. We talked about infection not being a major part of trauma initially, but can be a kind of secondary complication. And I asked you guys what the bacteria was, and a few of you told me that from the manga, it's Streptococcus mutans, which totally fits because it's a bacteria that lives in your mouth and has kind of particularly adapted to live on teeth. So that would explain why this bacteria is pictured here with a kind of head that looks like a tooth. So now you're up to speed, let's crack on with this episode. So we've seen the white blood cell here is surrounded by all the tissue destruction that we've seen from the trauma. I'm not sure if he's actually going through the blood vessels. So blood vessels, when they don't have any blood in them, are just gonna collapse down. <laughs> So this cell saying that tens of thousands, no millions, no even more than that red blood cells have been lost. I think that's fair to say. I mean, let's do a rough calculation. So we know they're in shock and assuming it's, you know, right on the limit of life threatening shock. We said from the last video, that's around 40% of your blood loss. So the average person has around five liters of blood in their body. So that's around two liters of blood that's been lost. When I ask for a full blood count, so a blood test when a patient comes into hospital, one of the metrics I get is the number of red blood cells in a microliter. And that should be around 5 million cells or 5 trillion cells in one liter. And we think we've lost around about two liters. So actually we probably estimate here that there's been around 10 trillion red blood cells lost in a bleed here. <laughs> And the cell saying as well, the bleeding hasn't stopped. This is a major principle of trauma medicine. It's kind of common sense. Yes, it's true we can resuscitate people with blood transfusion, but we really need to turn the tap off, so stop the actual site of the bleeding. Sometimes that might even be prepping people for surgery straight away if we can't apply direct pressure to where the bleeding is, or say a tourniquet if it's bleeding from a limb. We use the term in medicine, active bleeding, which is kind of a misnomer because any kind of bleeding sounds pretty active, doesn't it? But that just really means we can see the blood coming at the moment or we have evidence that there's ongoing bleeding. And this cell is perfectly summing up the term shock. So there's not enough oxygen getting to the tissues in the body due to a circulation problem. So to a doctor, this is not shock. That was terrible acting, but you know what I mean. Shock to a doctor is a life-threatening circulatory collapse causing loss of oxygen to the tissues exactly what this cell beautifully described. There are actually lots of different causes of shock, but in trauma, hemorrhagic shock, so shock of course from bleeding is the major one we worry about. So this is a really key point. So he's talking about the breathing system is going to have to compensate and also that we may get risk of hypothermia. And again, this harks back to the last episode. So do you remember the red blood cell talked about the six functions of the blood? Just to remind myself what order they mentioned them. It said retaining moisture, exchanging gases, transporting nutrients, 
thermoregulation, protecting the body and repairing wounds. It's important to know the functions of the blood because when we have a circulatory collapse in the form of hemorrhagic shock, then we're gonna see symptoms in these areas, symptoms we need to treat. The cell mentions the lungs here and number two and our list of functions of the blood is gas exchange. So we get a faster respiratory rate, so as doctors would pick up on this, and we'd need to give supplementary oxygen, so 15 liters of oxygen for a non rebreathe mask. And also, it mentions becoming very cold, so loss of thermoregulation. Also, I just want to pick up on this diagram here. It's kind of an interesting schematic of the circulatory system. And the majority of that is going to be constricting, so the blood vessels are getting narrower, so we can maintain blood pressure to the vital. To organs. So let's try and break it down quickly. So clearly we have the heart here, so the superior and inferior vena cava, so they're the main blood vessels going into the heart, so returning blood via the venous system. So coming out of the heart here, this must be the aorta, and the arch of the aorta has three main blood vessels coming off it. The first of which I think is missed out on this diagram, that's the brachiocephalic artery. Now you only have one of these because the heart's situated on the left hand side, the brachiocephalic artery takes the blood over to the right hand side um, of the upper limb and head basically, and it's called brachiocephalic because it turns into the brachial artery, um, that supplies the upper limb, and cephalic means head because it then splits into the common carotid artery, which supplies the head and neck. Next, coming around the arch here, we have the common carotid artery, so the left common carotid, and that supplies the head and neck on the left-hand side, and the left subclavian artery, which eventually becomes the left brachial artery, supplying the left upper limb. The diagram is kind of less familiar now, so I may be misinterpreting this, but there are lots of major and minor blood vessels that come off the descending aorta, but I think this circle here is supposed to represent the mesenteric artery, so the blood supply to the gut, because there's a connection to them all around the gut called the marginal artery. And if we are right on this, the mesenteric arteries the type of blood vessels that be constricting a lot because you know when we're bleeding we don't need to do a lot of digesting in the body oh so the red blood cell survived i think we saw that coming but <laughs> nice to know anyway Okay, and these cells are exactly mirroring what you see when people are struggling to breathe. And we kind of most commonly see it in young people like this in something like asthma. Not enough oxygen getting into the blood we call hypoxia. One of the really simple end of the bed assessments we can do for hypoxia is if the person can finish sentences or not. So this cell here is unable to do that without gasping for breath. So this is extremely severe. This difficulty in breathing we'd call dyspnea and often is associated with an increase in respiratory rate that we call tachypneic. So fast breathing. Um, so that's anything over 20 breaths a minute. The patient may also get blue lips or hands, what we call cyanosis, and the patient may also become confused. So the brain is such a high metabolic organ, needs lots of oxygen, so it's, if it's not getting that oxygen, the patient will become a bit delirious. And ultimately, if they begin to tire, their respiratory rate may start to drop, so that's a life-threatening sign, and they can also lose consciousness. Although these cells here are demonstrating symptoms of hypoxia due to lack of oxygen, it's worth noting that hemorrhagic shock can present in a very similar way with all those symptoms we just talked about. So this may well be exactly what our patient's looking like in real life. So this wind that they're saying here, this is def definitely tachypnea, what we talked about earlier. So a fast respiratory rate to try and compensate for that lack of blood that's going around the body. We're having to breathe harder to make use of all the circulation we've got. And we have a great little montage here, the red blood cell and her Padawan increasing their workload to try and make the most of the circulation that they're part of like the only bit of circulation left. This is exactly what would happen in shock. So we get an increase in heart rate and the constriction of the blood vessels, meaning the blood that would normally circulate around the body. So normally a red blood cell takes about 30 seconds to a minute to go around the whole body. But that increase in heart rate to make up for that um, drop in blood pressure is gonna mean that those red blood cells are gonna be circulating a lot quicker. Steve! 
供給間に合ってません<笑> So there we see the central nervous system here reacting to the drop in blood pressure. So the way they do this is via stretch receptors. So you have stretch receptors in the carotid artery around about uh, where the common carotid splits into the internal and external carotid and also in the aortic arch. So these send messages to say there's been kind of a drop in blood volume. Therefore, the central nervous system will activate the sympathetic nervous system. So we'll give you that fight or flight reflex and also release adrenaline circulating hormone into the body to do all the things like increase heart rate, constrict the blood vessels, that type of thing, which is I think what we're seeing here with this kind of increase in the gauge and <laughs> more people getting stressed at HQ up in the brain. <laughs> Bless them. We have our little platelets here repairing damage to the blood vessel wall. So they're, they're part of the primary hemostasis. So they kind of clump together and form part of the clot. And in this shot here, we see on their back, they have GP1B. What the hell is that, may you ask? The GP1B is a receptor on the platelets that when it activates them, it makes them kind of kick off their clot forming process. When we have damage to the endothelial cells, so the cells that line the blood vessel, the endothelial cells display something called von Willebrand's factor, and it's the von Willebrand factor that binds to the platelet. So only when the blood vessel has trauma and is damaged does it display this, the platelets then get this message and then start doing their clotting thing, which is exactly what you want, isn't it? So when you have damage to the blood vessel, that's when you want a clot to form. So the platelets being activated is what we call primary hemostasis. Secondary hemostasis is the coagulation of the blood. So the blood turning from a liquid to a solid, and ultimately this produces fibrin, which forms this kind of network lattice. So with the fibrin lattice and the clumped platelets plugging that up, we therefore get a clot. So I'm having flashbacks <laughs> to medical school because learning all this clotting stuff is the stuff of medical school nightmares. <laughs> This is really quite an advanced concept they're talking about here. So the blood pressure increasing due to the physiological response to the body and causing disruption of the clot and more bleeding. This is a real life problem in patients with an arterial bleed. So the more we try and restore the blood pressure with fluids and blood products, the more they're going to bleed. And this has led to fairly advanced concept and in some places quite a controversial concept of permissive hypotension. So this is where we allow the blood pressure to be lower than normal to try and reduce some of the bleeding and also to stop the blood pressure from overwhelming the clot and helping the clot form, but not too low. We don't let it, the blood pressure get so low that it will start damaging any of the organs. <laughs> That's it guys, hold on. <laughs> so now we're starting to see the hypothermia. So as we said before, one of the roles of the blood is thermoregulation. Hypothermia is a really important consideration in trauma and particularly when patients come into hospital because when we assess them initially, we start stripping them all off to make sure we're not missing anything, which is kind of not a good way to deal with hypothermia. So because of that, whenever we see patients in resuscitation bays, they're a lot warmer than normal. We also try and keep patients covered up as much as possible. And also when we give them fluids, we make sure that they're warmed. So they're warm fluids to try and keep their temperature up. This little montage here is, and kind of reflective thinking that the red blood cell has here, is very medically accurate. Throughout this whole series, we've seen the superheroes being the immune cells fighting all the pathogens, uh, which are kind of the bacteria and the viruses depict, being depicted as the enemy. But medicine is way more complicated than that. It's caused by lots of different things other than infections. And whenever we're stumped in an emergency as doctors about what's going on, 
we keep things incredibly simple. We do what's called an A to E assessment. And that starts with assessing and maintaining the airway, assessing and treating the breathing, assessing and treating the circulation. Now the red blood cell here is at the key of all of that, you know, in transporting the oxygen around the body. And if these aren't corrected, then these will kill you way quicker than an infection would. So the red blood cell here, exactly what they're talking about, it is their job at this point. It's all down to them. No superhero immune cell is going to save the day here. <laughs> little cheeky request because we've just seen all the cells of the immune system here that we've seen throughout the series and I've done my own homage to them. Face masks are mandatory all over the place at the moment given the pandemic so I've designed my own face covering so you guys can support the channel and it's got all the cells of the immune system so we have our red blood cell, our neutrophil and you guys can uh, look at all the different ones that we've seen throughout the series and um, we also have a little secret so when we open this up here we have some coronavirus that's come in and some of the immune cells are reacting to that if you want to support the channel they come in four different colors a surgical blue looking color a surgical green looking color and a pink and yellow um, but if you want to support the channel i'll leave a link down below A blood transfusion, this is awesome. So they've got slightly different uniforms, so indicating that people's red blood cells are gonna have slightly different receptors on the outside, what we call antigens. The major ones of those are the ABO or the rhesus antigens. These are really important because um, they determine if your blood's gonna be compatible for a blood transfusion or not. As giving someone a blood transfusion from an incompatible group, can be fatal so it's super super important and that's why when someone has a blood transfusion we must take blood first from the recipient to make sure we blood group it correctly for all those major antigens we also at that point do what's called a cross match so we take a tiny bit of blood from each and make sure um, and we mix them together to make sure they don't have some kind of reaction I'm, I'm guessing it's a little bit more complicated than that in the emergency though however we can give o negative so a universal donor blood to someone and that means there'll be no reactions to any of the major antigens but we won't have done that cross match process so there is still a risk that they may react in a way so giving people just transfusions in the emergency with O negative is really when we can't wait. However, there is this increased risk of a possible reaction because you're not going through this secondary process of cross matching to match any of the minor antigens. I suspect given the critical nature of this patient with the hypotension and the hypothermia, there isn't really time to do a cross match. It normally takes around 30 minutes to do all that. So they're probably getting O neg blood here. So Oh, this really is amazing. A kind of great ambassador for the importance of donating blood. I'll leave some links down below if you want to be a hero and want to donate red blood cells and save someone's life like we see here. Worth noting as well that when you donate blood, you don't just donate packed red blood cells, which we see here. You also donate platelets, which are really important if to give to someone if they're bleeding, right? Because platelets are used up in the clotting process. And we also get plasma, so the liquid part of the blood that contains the clotting proteins that are involved in that secondary hemostasis. So it's actually possible with on one blood donation that you actually save three people's lives. <laughs> We have a nice tender moment between our two protagonists here. Talk about how many red blood cells they lost. Well, you know, we made an estimate earlier around about 10 trillion red blood cells. I can totally vouch for this. I've seen many people at death's door where a blood transfusion has saved their life. One of the ones that really sticks with me was a lady who had a postpartum hemorrhage, so a bleed after giving birth, and she lost liters of blood. And so because of those people that donated that blood, you know, a child 
still had a mum. This, I'm sure this is true for most people's jobs, but work isn't just about knowing stuff, it's about experience and also to have a passionate heart. This certainly rings true for healthcare, and I know it will for most jobs, but I do think Sales at Work has echoed a lot of my reflections from looking at the series from working in healthcare. So there you have it, my final reaction to this first series of Sales at Work. Now I know there's a bonus episode, we'll get onto that someday, but I'm super looking forward to season two and Sales at Work Black. I've already looked at one of the Sales at Black mangas, so I'll leave a link to that. I just wanna say, take this opportunity to say thank you for all the support you've given me for your patience in getting these videos out to you it's been a pretty crazy year and actually you guys have helped me a lot you know get through the tough times this year from all the support you've done on the channel and I think that really sales away has been a huge part of that growth of the channel and the community on the channel so I just want to say thank you to you so on that note have a fantastic new year. Let's hope for better days in 2021 and I'll be back soon.